Ruben, go ahead. I'm honored to introduce Thomas Homer Dixon, Tad, to his friends. You know something of his professional record because it was in the email advertising this session. I only want to add that Tad has long been seen by his peers as a reliable leader, a reliable creator of that which is new, whether insights or institutions. I also want to say three things about Tad as I have come to know him as a person. Unlike so many in our modern techno-industrial culture, he takes personhood seriously, both his own and that of the rest of us. If you read his new book, which I commend to you, Commanding Hope, you will see this. It's especially obvious in the first chapters of the book in the way that he talks of his children. Second, he takes the situation we now find ourselves in more seriously than most. He is clear and explicit that the solutions which are bandied about in our culture, while they may be feasible, are not enough to ensure our future. This too is set out in Commanding Hope. Finally, he takes his own responsibility to make differences seriously. The newish Cascade Institute, which he founded and now leads, is an expression of this commitment. Cascade is committed to articulating the strategies and steps which are needed to put us on a path to doing enough to cope with the realities of the messy, complex living systems that we now face. You can see this in his, you can see this commitment in his advice to the prime minister in the last paragraphs of his recent article in the Globe. So in sum, Tad has the capacities and courage to change the focus of our attention, the tenor of our conversations, and the nature of our work. Tad, it's my pleasure to invite you to speak to KCOR after 15 years absence. Over to you. Thank you so much, Ruben. That, that was just a deeply moving, remarkably warm introduction. Thank you. And uh, Ruben is an old friend. We have exchanged ideas for decades, I guess now. And also it's wonderful to be back talking to the uh, Canadian Club of Rome group. I guess the last time I did was in Ottawa in person in those days when we could actually meet in person about 15, maybe even 20 years ago uh, in the press gallery, I seem to recall. And it was a great conversation and a good crowd. So today I want to reflect on the World 3 model. It was the computational underpinning of the limits to growth study that we're all very familiar with. Uh, and, and this is the beginning of a conversation that I hope will lead to an article that may be co-authored with some of my colleagues about how this uh, model and this approach to understanding global systems was right and how it was wrong. And uh, I uh, and, and much of what I'm saying today is just, as I say, it, 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 in the form of initial arguments, speculations, some hypotheses, and be very interested in people's feedback, uh, either today or perhaps an email, email correspondence as we go forward. I'm going to try to speak for about 45 minutes. I have a considerable amount of ground to cover. I was working on this slideshow this morning and kept getting longer and longer, but it also kept getting more and more interesting. Uh, and, uh, and so uh, I'm going to go fairly quickly. Now, the good thing about this audience is that it's a high level audience and I can assume a, a fairly rich understanding of the state of the world. Uh, and, uh, and then we should hopefully have still about half an hour or three quarters of an hour for a conversation. So I'm going to uh, uh, seize the screen as we're allowed to do. 
It's always so satisfying to do this kind of thing. Here we go. Now, I think you should see the opening slide. Could I just have confirmation that everybody's got that? You're good. Good. And I'm going to shrink this. Don't need to look at my own face. So um, I did put this uh, slide presentation together reasonably quickly. A couple of things may be a little bit out of order. Um, I wasn't expecting to have the kind of tidal wave of interest in my piece in the Globe and Mail on January 1st about the decline or potential collapse of democracy in the United States. And so that's been absorbing a lot of my attention over the last uh, 10 days or so. Um, uh, but let's uh, talk about this a little bit autobiographically. Uh, this actually isn't the cover of my own copy. It was one I've, uh, image I found online, but it sure looks like my own copy of this book. And I imagine quite a few of you have it stuffed away somewhere on a shelf. Uh, uh, probably one of the most um, widely sold uh, environmental books in history, if not the most, I think some 40 million copies are in circulation, trans translated into a gazillion languages. Really, it, it was the book that brought the Club of Rome to uh, global attention. So it's kind of a foundational document for uh, the Canadian Association of the Club of Rome. And as you know, uh, it was a report on the findings from a, uh, a computer model uh, based on the work of Jay Forrester at MIT, uh, system dynamics uh, um, modeling approach. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in the future. Some of you may be quite familiar with the underlying computer program. Uh, this was published in 1972, so we're coming up to the 50th anniversary. I expect we're going to see quite a wave of articles about, uh, about uh, whether it was right or wrong and the, the state of the world as compared to what was projected uh, it, it, with this model 50 years ago. Uh, and uh, as I suggested, I want to contribute to some of that conversation going forward, but I expect a lot of it, unfortunately, is gonna be quite uninformed. And, uh, and I've tried to suggest how it could be better informed in the rest of my presentation. Uh, where did I encounter this, uh, this program? <clears throat> I started at the University of Victoria as an undergraduate in 1975. And in 1976 or 77, actually, I think it was probably now 78, I took a computer science course. Uh, and uh, it, I found it just enormously fascinating. Uh, uh, enjoyed the process of programming and developing algorithms. And uh, my uh, computer science prof, I, I quickly sort of established myself at the top of the class because I was enjoying it so much. And my computer science prof gave me opportunities to do unusual things and to sort of go off on my own. And uh, I had already read Limits to Growth at that point, And uh, I wrote away for the program and the program arrived in a box and it arrived as I think 900 punch cards. Uh, some of you may remember those days. Uh, we had a mainframe in the bottom of that building. This is the Claire Hugh building at, at UVic and uh, all our computer work had to be done in batch processes through the mainframe. This is an uh, IBM 36 machine. I think it was probably what we had there at the time. It was in a, a, a a climate control room with uh, a positive air pressure. Uh, everybody had to wear uh, sort of white coats when they went in and out, it was all very impressive. And uh, you would provide uh, the, <clears throat> the, the system with uh, a batch of punch cards, which would be read by a punch card reader. And uh, you'd come back for your dot matrix printout sometime later to see what the results of your program were. And I spent a lot of time on that machine producing those. And, then, and looking at the average age of us in this meeting today, I expect a lot of us remember doing this back in the 1960s, 70s. Uh, and uh, uh, it was how I cut my teeth in programming. It was all in Fortran, of course, in those days. Um, so I spent quite a bit of time playing with the model, uh, using this machine to, uh, to uh, push the parameters, tweak the model, uh, see what the results were, 
when I tried runs that were different from those that were reproduced in the book itself, the Limits to Growth book itself. Now, what most importantly did this model get right? It was really the first attempt to look at the global system as a whole and not just geopolitically or socially, but as a material social system or now what we would now call a socio-ecological system, a global socio-ecological system. This is commonplace these days. An image of earth from space is uh, iconic, but you have to remember in those early days, this was shortly after the Apollo program brought back those remarkable photographs from space of the planet, you know, this blue marble in a black void. It, 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 this was really part of that paradigm shift to understanding not only the integration of global systems at the, at the level of the planet as a whole, but also our ex extraordinary isolation in the universe uh, from other like living systems and the seeming fragility of the, of the earth and its biosphere. Interestingly enough, the photograph you're looking at here is an Apollo photograph. It still is the case that some of the best photographs ever taken of the earth from space were taken by hand with Hasselblad cameras from those Apollo, Apollo missions. And if you want to take a look at them, uh, Toby Ord, O-R-D, a scholar at Oxford has produced a remarkable range of uh, refurbished NASA photographs that are available uh, in the public domain and on his website. So uh, you have probably seen this many times. This is a reproduction of the standard run of the model. I'm not going to get too much into the details of what each of the functions represents. I mean, they're pretty straightforward. This is of course not what it looked like in the book. Uh, I'll show you what it looked like in the book and in the dot matrix printout shortly. Uh, but it's actually much easier to read. The other thing that's different about this reproduction of the standard run of the model is uh, the timeline across the bottom because the authors were actually quite, uh, quite deliberately did not put the full time scale across the bottom. I think they had 1900 and 2100 and you had to insert sort of roughly guess where the intervening intervals were. Uh, but in this case, they've been inserted. Now I notice that, uh, 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 it, it, you know, the experiment hasn't run its full course yet. It's common among conservative circles for people to say, oh, the limits to growth have been disproven. Uh, they're wrong. Uh, the world hasn't collapsed. But if you actually look at the timeline here, uh, the, the model suggests, and I point this out in my book, Commanding Hope, that uh, it's about now or around 2030 to 2040 when things are going to go haywire, that uh, sharp nonlinearities and systems are going to occur. And uh, there will be, a, for instance, a dramatic drop in the well-being of human beings and uh, collapse ultimately in population around 2050. Uh, so, so the experiment hasn't run its course. It's not correct to say that the limits to growth has been disproven by reality, uh, despite the fact that that's a, a common meme out there or trope that, uh, especially among conservative circles. So what did the model not get right? And it's common when talking about world three to pay a lot of attention to parameters. That, and if you, if you look at the model, and this is something I realized fairly early on when I was playing with the Fortran code uh, and looking at the basically the source book that came along with the the, uh, uh, um, with the punch cards, it, it was uh, apparent that, frankly, a lot of the parameters have been sort of pulled out of thin air. And one example I talk about in my, in my book uh, is the relationship postulated in the model between economic growth, investment in health services, and changes in life expectancy. So it, uh, it, that's a very important uh, parameter, of course, uh, uh, and it depends fundamentally on estimates of people's preferences for investment in health services. Uh, that that parameter was 
uh, entered into the program basic value for it. It was tweakable, of course, you could adjust it, but the justification for the value used by the modelers, uh, Meadows et al., Donella Meadows and uh, Jorgen Randers and uh, Donella Meadows' husband, whose name immediately escapes me, very well known, uh, uh, the just, their justification for, for the Dennis Meadows for the use of, uh, of that particular parameter was very weak. And in many cases, there was no justification at all. There was numbers put in. Uh, now that's not a problem in itself, but there was a lot of work to do to actually nail down uh, the input variables. But I actually think that the, the underlying uh, challenge or the underlying problem with this, this model that while, while um, not being totally debilitating is very fundamental uh, is different. It doesn't relate to the parameters. It relates to the understanding of the nature of resources, in particular, this distinction between renewable resources and non-renewable resources. And this is a distinction that is highlighted all the way through the book. And one of the things I was doing this morning is I was pulling out some quotations to show how that distinction is made. Now, the key, the key point here is that the world three model assumes the collapse is largely driven by scarcities of non-renewable resources, minerals, oil, and the like. Uh, whereas what we've learned in the last 50 years is that uh, the uh, challenge that we face is substantially driven not by scarcities of non-renewable resources, but uh, the, the uh, degradation of renewable resource systems. One of the things that I think the, the uh, world three modelers uh, suffered from in a sense of deficit of knowledge that affected their understanding of how to put this model together is that the whole apparatus of complex system science had not arrived on the scene yet. There were bits of pieces of it out there, but it hadn't coalesced into an understanding of complex systems. Uh, which could have informed the way they constructed the model. And I think if they had had that understanding of complex systems, they would have uh, substantially downplayed the, the uh, seriousness of scarcities of non-renewable resources, the threat posed by scarcities of non-renewable resources, and it would have made much more central uh, the problem of degradation of renewable resources. So I'm gonna spend a bit of time unpacking this argument in a little bit more detail. There's the uh, world model standard run as produced in the book. It's exactly the same as the one I showed before, uh, with, where we've just have, uh, traced out solid lines for the various functions. Uh, but uh, you can see the, the uh, residue, sort of the, the, the dot matrix printer in action right there. That's of course what all these printouts that I managed to get from the computer look like when I was doing my runs. And uh, uh, in their description of this standard run, they're quite explicit. The behavior mode of the system shown in figure 35 is clearly that of overshoot and collapse. And by the way, I think the general paradigm of overshoot and collapse is important and one significant contribution by this approach. The idea that you can push beyond the, uh, uh, the sort of this threshold of resilience of a system is now much better understood in complex system science. And then the system will break down after that threshold is, is exceeded. And I'll come back to that in a few minutes. But then they go on to say, in this run, the collapse occurs because of non-renewable resource depletion. The industrial capital stock rose to a level that requires an enormous input of resources. In the process of that growth, it depletes a large fraction of the resource reserves available. As resource prices rise and mines are depleted, more and more capital must be used for obtaining resources, leaving less to be invested for future growth. Finally, investment cannot keep up with depreciation and the industrial base collapses, taking with it the service and agricultural systems which have become dependent on industrial inputs. So their thesis is very clear. Uh, and I think it's substantially wrong. So this actually is a statement from earlier in the, in the uh, 
uh, document. Um, our world model was built specifically to investigate five major trends of global concern, accelerating industrialization, rapid population growth, widespread malnutrition, depletion of non-renewable resources, and a deteriorating environment. So uh, I did a search this morning of the use of the term non-renewable resources, or actually of the adjective non-renewable, and it turns up something like 60 times in the book. I did an independent search, search for the adjective renewable, and it turns up once. Uh, to the extent that complex systems behavior, especially involving ecological and living systems, turns up in the book, it's it, under the general uh, rubric of pollution, and the deter what they call here in this sentence a deteriorating environment. Uh, and, and so it's basically uh, uh, the output load from industrial systems on uh, natural systems, on living systems, uh, and uh, in the form of pollution. Uh, and, uh, and there's not a really a sophisticated understanding in the model of the nature of those natural systems themselves and their complexity and how they might respond to this increasing stress imposed by pollution. And of course, I didn't check, but I'm pretty sure that there's no mention of carbon dioxide in the book, but somebody may correct me. It's certainly not highlighted uh, and, and the possibility of climate change. There were other forms of pollution that were mentioned. And in fact, pollution was just a general category that under which an enormous range of stresses on the natural environment were lumped. to go on about their approach to, uh, this is the one place where renewable resources is mentioned, as it turns out in the book. The resources that permit growth of that capital stock tend to be, uh, tend not to be renewable resources like land or water, but renewable resources, but non-renewable resources like fuels or metals. And thus the expansion of food production in the future is very much dependent on the availability of non-renewable resources. So then they start talking about those non-renewable resources. And one of the most important tables in the book is table four. I'll show you a couple of clips from it in a moment uh, that looks at uh, minerals and petroleum and their estimated rate of depletion and when they are going to quote unquote run out. Uh, at the present rate of expansion, silver, tin and uranium may be in short supply even at higher prices by the turn of the century. That's well below before now, uh, 22 years ago now. By the year 2050, several more minerals may be exhausted. They will have run out if the current rate of consumption continues. So this notion of exhaustion of non-renewable resources weaves its way entirely through the analysis. Here's table four. Um, and, uh, and note aluminum, because I think aluminum is mentioned. It's not mentioned here, but it'll be mentioned, I think, in my, one of my next slides. Uh, uh, they, 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 they did a linear extrapolation of the of current consumption rates and uh, uh, against uh, current reserves to produce uh, a, uh, a, it's what they call a static index of the point of exhaustion, which you can see is 100 years there for aluminum. But then they, uh, they uh, calculate the remaining reserves based on uh, uh, growth rates of consumption going forward. And of course, that reduces the remaining reserves substantially, in this case, down to 31 years. Uh, and then that they also estimated the remaining reserves using uh, exponential growth of consumption uh, with also a, a multiplier on the actual known reserves of five times. And in this case, you see that just bumps the uh, uh, the, the, the point of exhaustion pushes it forward into the future for aluminum just to 55 years. So in an extra, uh, what, 30, 24 years. Um, doesn't make a huge difference, a five-fold increase. And they come back to this point repeatedly, uh, a five-fold increase in known reserves if you're dealing with exponential growth and consumption doesn't actually uh, make much difference. And here we have petroleum at the bottom. Five-fold increase in known reserves pushes the uh, point of exhaustion out 50 years, which is now. 
2022. Well, petroleum is not exhausted. For better or for worse, it's not exhausted. Uh, a couple of other quotations. The prices of these resources with the shortest static reserves indices have already begun to increase. The price of mercury, for example, has gone up 500% in the last 20 years. The price of lead has increased 300% in the last 30 years. Well, there's mercury. This, this is up to about uh, 2012 or so. I think I couldn't find any more recent data as I was searching this morning. They were looking at a period of time when this book came out right there. And sure, it looked like we were facing a scarcity of mercury. That was before it was established that mercury was a toxic substance and people started to try to get it out of uh, a lot of devices and a lot of industrial processes. Uh, and so all of a sudden there was a glut of mercury, but uh, um, there's certainly been no es substantial escalation in price of the kind that was projected at the time the modeling was done. But this is not just, you might think that mercury is sui generis because of its, its health impacts. Um, but when we look at aluminum, nickel, tin, all the minerals that they list in table four, there is no clear trend line when it comes to cost. Uh, Long-term prices have stayed. There has been periods of time when they spiked, other periods of time when they declined. It's very closely associated with the business cycle. Uh, periods of rapid economic growth and inflationary growth produce high, high prices for these minerals and periods of uh, deflationary or re re recessions in the global economy uh, produce collapse in prices. Uh, nothing along the lines of what the, was estimated by the world three modelers. Here we have copper, lead and zinc. Now, uh, because we're, you know, right at the moment, we're seeing escalation in some of these prices because we've seen trillions and trillions of dollars of liquidity pumped into the world economy. And so we have inflationary pressures, uh, but I don't see any reason why this is going to produce a state change in the availability of these minerals. It turns out that when it comes to non-renewables, humankind is exceptionally good at sustaining the flow of these things uh, it appears to be more or less indefinitely, as long as, and I want to underline, as long as we have sufficient energy to uh, climb the uh, entropy hill, uh, to invest in, in, in dealing with increasingly low-grade resources uh, and allow, allowing us to produce higher-grade resources of lower entropy, higher-grade uh, concentrations of these ores, uh, uh, of much lower entropy that can sustain our complex industrial civilization. As long as we have sufficient energy, we can, uh, we can dig up as much of the Earth's crust as we want to concentrate the minerals we need to, uh, uh, to sustain uh, the complexity of our industrial processes. These are not hard limits to economic growth just depends on how much of the planet we want to trash. So let's talk about their approach to pollution. Uh, it, it's, uh, it, it really by current standards is remarkably um, simplistic and uninformed. And that you can't hold them responsible for this. There's been a lot of learning in the last 50 years. Here's a key statement. There's a few kinds of pollution that have actually been measured over time seem to be increasing exponentially. That's fairly true. We have almost no knowledge about where the upper limits to these pollution growth curves might be. That's also true. And now uh, we're starting to discern some of those upper limits, the pre especially when it comes to, for instance, saturation of natural carbon sinks. The presence of natural delays in ecological processes increases the probability of underestimating the control measures necessary and therefore inadvertently reaching those upper limits. Now that, I think, is an important statement. And that's the kind of thing that most complexity scientists nowadays would would nod their heads in response to. This uh, suggests that we're dealing with systems that exhibit hysteresis, for example, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Many pollutants are globally distributed. Their harmful effects, effects appear long distance from their points of generation. Boy, is that ever true. But that's it. That's pretty well all they say. And uh, given what we know now, uh, we would put much more emphasis on these these effects uh, looking at the world today. 
So let me talk a little bit about characteristics of renewables. And actually, I think the distinction should be between, not between renewables and non-renewables, but between complex resources and non-complex resources. And that's the distinction I make when I write this up in Commanding Hope in chapter three of Commanding Hope. We should ditch this distinction between renewables and non-renewables and instead talk about complex resources. Most renewables are complex resources and non-complex resources. Most non-renewables are non-complex resources. And I'll discuss what I mean by this. So complex resources, renewables are connected. They're connected together in, in networks of, uh, of, of connections that, that uh, mean that the consequences of uh, damaging one renewable have concatenating or ramifying effects on other parts of the system. They're dynamic in the sense that they, uh, there is a, usually an energy flow across them. And so they are changing their, and uh, there there are flows of energy, of material, uh, if living systems, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and the like, of uh, of often information across these systems, and they also change and evolve over time. They change their configurations and morphologies over time. They're complex, and I'll come back to what I mean by complex. It's really fundamental in a moment. Uh, they usually involve living components, not always. And it's significantly, you can think of the atmosphere as a complex system. Even if you removed all life on the planet, it would remain complex. Uh, um, but that it's a particular kind of complex system, which I'll come back to in a moment. Uh, on the other hand, most of the complex systems we see on the planet either uh, involve life centrally or significantly uh, as subcomponents, including the atmospheric ocean system. Of course, living systems are a very important part of that overall system for, for instance, recycling carbon. Okay, so the important distinction here is that, uh, this is some logging I think on Vancouver Island, um, is that uh, when you damage a complex resource or what has been commonly called a renewable resource, you don't just affect that resource alone. I made this point originally in my work on environmental scarcity and violence in developing countries back in the 1990s. And I was really surprised at how it wasn't recognized by a lot of people who thought about these issues, especially, frankly, social scientists who tended not to be informed about the nature, about the, the characteristics of natural systems. But when you damage a forest, the damage doesn't remain just in the vicinity of the logged hillside. You, as you know, you, you, you uh, uh, have, for instance, silt washing off the hillside because there's uh, less absorption capacity. You have floods that take a lot of silt down to local streams and creeks that can plug those silt creeks up, which are no longer available for, for instance, spawning salmon or trout. If you're logging enough of the area, you change the hydrological cycle regionally. Uh, if, you, if you burn it significantly, and I've seen this, my father was a forester. I've seen this in places where the, the, the land hasn't been effectively husbanded after logging, uh, you can actually burn away the topsoil and you can change, change the landscape to desert and it dries the, it substantially dries the landscape out because your landscape out because you're changing the regional hydrological cycle. There's less evaporation into the atmosphere, less rainfall. Uh, so you've got all of these, what I call uh, ramifying effects using the the real meaning of the word ramifying, which means branching. It branches out the consequences because these are dynamic, highly connected systems. They, any damage to or degradation of a renewable resource often has uh, multiplying consequences that branch out into other dependent uh, parts of the uh, complex renewable resource system. Now, that's distinct from uh, a mineral, which uh, sits in the ground and is ecologically inert. Now, digging it out of the ground, as you can see here, is gonna do a lot of damage. 
it's going to do a lot of damage to uh, renewable resources locally, water supplies, soils, topsoil, uh, perhaps the local climate if you're, if you're again changing a hydrological cycle by changing the landscape. But the actual removal of the resource itself, which was buried underground, if it could simply sort of be magically evaporated uh, and uh, the face filled up, the, the space filled up with something else, uh, there would be no ramifying consequences for other parts of the system because there's, there are no other things dependent fundamentally causally on this non-renewable resource, this mineral. It's just sitting in the ground inert. Uh, and uh, and so, so the result is that the ingenuity requirements for responding to the downstream consequences of uh, non-renewable resource extraction are much lower overall than the ingenuity requirements, the requirements for complex solutions in response to massive degradation of renewable resources, uh, because you have a lot more problems generating generated when you damage, badly damage renewable resources because of these concatenating or ramifying effects. So the consequence of these characteristics of renewable resources you have large external costs from use. So that's the, those are the ramifying consequences. I talked about spill out effects uh, in part because it's hard to establish property rights for these resources because they can't be easily bounded can't draw lines around them so easily. You have weak market incentives to protect, conserve, and substitute for those resources. Uh, this is what economists call market failure, and they tend to be particularly acute for renewable resources as compared to non-renewable resources. Their non-excludability in eco-speak, in econo-speak, uh, which means you, you can't exclude other people from using them easily, makes it hard to establish property rights. They have nonlinear responses to stress or perturbations frequently. I'll come back to this. And then finally, they often exhibit hysteresis uh, in the sense that if they change to another state or flip to another state, tip to another state, uh, it can be very difficult to reverse those processes to bring the system back to its original condition. So you can't get back to where you were along the same route that got you to where you are. That's the sort of key definition I like to use for hysteresis, which means there's, a, it, it, there's an absence of simple reversibility. Uh, once we flip the climate or flip an ecosystem or flip the permafrost because of thaws, we're not going back to where we are, to where we were before. These systems have multiple equilibria, easiest, most easily most easily represented by something like a, an energy landscape, where you think of a ball on this energy landscape that sits in a basin, a basin of attraction, which is a local equilibrium. It's a place where the system has to do less work, have a, a lower throughput of energy to remain stable. If it's perturbed though, it can go into another basin that may in, uh, be involved in quite substantially different state characteristics. Uh, it could be operating in a fundamentally different way. When we talk about these tipping events, we uh, 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 often think of the, the shock that perturbs the system, the ball in the basin and knocks it from one basin into another. What we often forget about is that there can be long-term processes that actually change the configuration of the landscape that, that shallow the basin and uh, cause, cause it to become easier for the system in question to be perturbed or knocked from one base into another because uh, it doesn't have to be knocked as hard to move it from one place to another. So there are these two quite distinct form uh, phenomena. They're the slow process changes of reconfiguration of the landscape and shallowing and sometimes deepening of basins. And then there are the fast process shocks and crises that can knock a, a system from one uh, equilibrium to another. So renewable resource systems have these characteristics. You may not notice much change for a long time, but there's ongoing degradation of say the soil has been eroded, it's been become more thinner over time. 
uh, forests have been fragmented. It looks like everything's okay. And then all of a sudden, lo and behold, you get a precipitous decline in agricultural yields uh, because as you reduce the soil depth by say 80%, uh, along comes a period of drought, uh, perhaps induced by anthropogenic climate change. And if you'd had your full soil depth, you would have been able to sustain your agricultural production through that, but now you can't because there's not enough rooting depth for the crops and they die. Uh, and it's that long-term change that is interacted with the short-term change to cause a flip of the system to a different state, perhaps the desertification of the agricultural region. So I'm looking at the time. I'd like to finish up in about five, about 10 minutes or so. Um, I'm going to shift now to just talk a little bit about complex systems. I'm gonna go quite quickly, just to get some ideas on the table uh, and to kind of stress our global complex systems and renewable resource systems are under right now. Uh, this is just a contextualizing uh, the climate change problem. It's a diagram I use in my book that I produced from readily available data. It's a, it's a form of the notorious hockey stick diagram that the a conservative anti-climate activists, anti-climate policy activists have attacked for a long time, but the data are actually very solid. Uh, just the important point here is that we are moving well outside the range of tropospheric temperatures on this planet that has prevailed, not just for the period of time during which human civilization uh, was laid down, modern human civilization, the last 2000 years or so when we've laid down our our uh, urban areas, our agricultural zones, irrigation systems, our ports, our transportation networks. But going back to the end of the last ice age, the whole entire Holocene epoch, going back to 11,500 years or so, the total variation in temperature during that period has been about well, across a range of about 0 0.7 degrees. And we are moving well outside of that boundary very, very fast. And, uh, and uh, virtually none of the ecosystems on the planet will be able to adapt quickly enough to this kind of change. And I should say that I don't see a world in which modern liberal democracy is sustainable at temperatures over two degrees Celsius either. Um, and that's something we can talk about in a little bit more detail perhaps. Some of, this, uh, some of the implications of this kind of change have been uh, uh, elaborated in a series of articles. Many of you may be familiar with these articles. This is a very important one. It appeared a few years ago by Will Steffen and co-authors, Trajectories of the Earth System in the Anthropocene. And they um, produced this iconic diagram, which got a huge amount of attention at the time. But you'll notice that it has the same kind of uh, complex systems uh, orientation or paradigm or sort of ontological uh, foundation in the background looking in this case, it's an epigenetic landscape, but it's very similar to a, a uh, uh, energy landscape in terms of its underlying assumptions, uh, suggesting that there are these tipping points and that once we get locked into uh, a particularly nasty hothouse earth uh, future, it's gonna be very, very difficult for us to get ourselves out of it. And they talk about uh, a subsystem a tipping points, not at just the global level, but also uh, within uh, or what they call tipping elements within the global system that are increasingly observed to be connected together. Uh, so you can get cascades of tipping events potentially around the world. Again, we're now seeing these are the, exactly the kind of ramification consequences that I was talking about before. We're now seeing much more sophistication in recognizing that it's the living systems and the complex resources on this planet that provide us with vital services in our economies that are really the limits to growth. Climate change is already sucking trillions of dollars out of the global economy, and it's going to get a lot worse very fast. Uh, so more literature that's making a similar sort of point, talking about uh, the possible shifts, sudden shifts in the Earth's biosphere, another, uh, that was actually quite fundamental to me. I actually start my book, Commanding Hope, with my daughter, who was four years old at the time, picking up this article and asking her mother what it was about, um, which occasioned a, a moment of uh, something approaching emotional trauma on Sarah's part. Um, uh, so, uh, we are, this is all part of our common understanding, especially within the group right now of how our world is changing. 
as Stefan Ramsdorf says, very prominent German climate scientist, we are catapulting ourselves way out of the Holocene. If humanity stays on its current trajectory, we'll not recognize our Earth by the end of the century. And I don't know about you guys, but I wake up every night thinking about this. I have, I have, my, my children are now 16 and 13, and I am terrified for their future. Here's another article, very important, that talks about these connections between tipping elements or tipping points and the possibility of cascading tipping points. The clearest emergency would be if we were approaching a global cascade of tipping points that led to a new, less ha habitable hothouse climate state. We argue that cascading effects might be common and examples are starting to be observed. And there you see the similar sort of diagram looking at these possible connections, these ramifying consequences across uh, uh, subsystems of the larger global socio-ecological system. The evidence from tipping points alone suggests that we are in a state of planetary emergency. And then another one that I, uh, article that I uh, try to bring to be people's attention to is this one on changing risks of simultaneous global breadbasket failure. The, the, the Club of Rome, the World Tree model did look closely at food supply. Uh, but again, as you saw from those previous quotations, they emphasize the fact in, to, in their view that, that the threats to global food supply were going to arise from uh, scarcities of non-renewable resources. I suppose I'd have to take a look, but things like potash uh, uh, and, and uh, sources of nitrogen. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, but it actually turns out that the, the biggest threat to global food supply is almost certainly climate change and the possibility of extreme events that produce um, a sudden shocks to critical food growing regions in the world. And not just one each year or every couple of years, but potentially simultaneously in Europe, Australia, and North America, producing a very rapid run up in global food prices in a, a tightly integrated global food market. So this is where I put on my hat as a political scientist who um, helped pioneer the study of the relationship between environmental stress and civil violence. The fastest route to civil violence within societies is to threaten the food supply for those societies. This, <clears throat> this kind of uh, climate impact would have truly catastrophic implications for civil order around the world. So I, I'm not sure I can read this because it's behind some stuff on my screen here, but basically they show an increasing risk of simultaneous failure of wheat, maize, and soybean crops across the breadbaskets analyzed. So um, 43 minutes, let me uh, zip through a couple of things relating to complex systems. Uh, you, everybody thinks they know what a system is, and I think people in these groups do, but I want to just nail down some complexity concepts for those who may be a little bit rusty on what, when I talk about complex systems and I say what World 3 missed was the importance of scarcities of complex resources and their responses, how complex resources respond to stress and degradation, what do I mean by complexity? So let me just spend a few minutes on that. Uh, so a system, before we do that, we have to define what we mean by a system. And this is a fairly straightforward definition and probably corresponds to most people's intuitions. Uh, a system consists of components that are linked, linked together with that have a persistent pattern of relationships where those links have a persistent pattern of relationships. And there's a flow of energy through those links that sustains that pattern. And then you establish a boundary of some kind and quite often with complex systems, that boundary is quite arbitrary. It's difficult to actually divide it, that system off from other systems, as I explained, you have these connections to everything else. Uh, but um, there is usually a place where it seems reasonable to draw a boundary and you call everything inside the components of a particular ecosystem, a forest, forest ecosystem, for example. Representations of systems, the links can stand for flows of material energy or information between system components, for causal relationships between state variables, or for, and this is important, semantic or intentional relations between meaningful mental states. And one of the most important things that was left out of World 3 is everything that's going on 
in human minds. Now, they made lots of assumptions about preferences. I mentioned some of the uh, parameter assumptions uh, earlier in my presentation, but they didn't have any way of representing or modeling those belief systems. But it turns out those belief systems are really, really important to how the system develops, uh, how these socioecological systems develop. Flow maps, uh, the first bullet there, tend to represent specific systems. They tell a story, an ideographic story about specific systems. Causal maps uh, are better for representing classes of systems. They can be nomothetic in the sense that they establish generalizations across sets of systems. And then mental maps can represent the beliefs and value states of either individuals, individual people, or classes of individuals. And here I have a little diagram of a, of a house this is based on our house in Fergus, Ontario, before we left. We did actually didn't have an oil tank. It was a gas-fired boiler, but uh, it was easier to represent it. And, you know, this is a hideous contraption now in the day of climate change, but it makes the point fairly easily. Here we have three systems. There's a heat generation system, a heat distribution system inside the house, and a heat control system in the form of a thermostat, and a human being uh, adjusting the thermostat. The stock flow model of the kind that was used by World 3 and system dynamics looks something like this. You have oil and oil flowing out of an oil tank into the boiler where it's burned and it produces heat and CO2. And this is, these are all sort of material factors. You can actually measure them uh, quite easily, but you can think of stuff actually moving around in the system. And this is, stock flow models were at the core of the World 3 model of system dynamics, basically a stock flow approach. A causal model, uh, looks more like this, where you have, and notice that you need several things happening simultaneously on the left-hand side in order to get combustion. You need a thermostat signal and oil in the tank and the boiler that can burn that oil. Uh, so this is much more of a Boolean approach where you have these Boolean operators of and. Uh, each is a necessary condition. And if you have all three conditions fire, you get combustion. And that combustion then produces the plus signs indicate a positive correlation and then produces an increase in emissions of CO2, increased production of heat. And the uh, thermostat relationship there, you've got more heat because you've got a, a person that's adjusting a thermostat. The, as the heat goes up, the thermostat signal is uh, eventually turned down and you get, uh, you get no thermostat signal. And so the combustion stops for a period of time. Uh, so there's an inverse correlation between heat and a thermostat signal calling for combustion. And combustion also has an inverse correlation with the amount of oil in the oil tank. Now, it's generally considered by system dynamics advocates that these kinds of models are inferior to stock flow models, but I would actually argue the reverse. I think that uh, causal models are ultimately much more powerful than stock flow models because they can be the basis for generalization and nomothetic statements about the nature of a system. And, uh, uh, and also because, as we have used in our research with the Cascade Institute, you can include these Boolean operators and an OR relationships into a causal model very easily. Uh, and we do that with a process and approach that I'll talk about in just a couple of minutes. The semantic intentional model is different. In this case, you're looking at the belief systems in people's heads, the person actually turning that thermostat. Winter means cold and discomfort. Uh, one way of dealing with the cold and discomfort is to turn the third thermostat up because if you turn the thermostat up, it means warmth and comfort and survival. We know that the thermostat is connected to the boiler and the boiler is connected to oil. All of those things are connected together in our belief system. And if we don't, and we know that if we don't put enough oil in the, in the oil tank, the boiler won't be able to run and then we won't be able to stay warm. So this is our belief understanding. It's what's in our heads. And it turns out it's a really important part of the system, which often gets overlooked. So properties of complex systems. With that as background and the nature of systems, very quickly, when we talk about co complex systems, it's useful distinguishing between constitutive properties and behavioral properties. Constitutive properties are the causes of complexity and the behavioral properties are the observed effects. When you ask complex systems folks, generally ask them, what is complexity? They'll re generally refer to behavioral properties. And there's, there are properties like this. 
complex systems exhibit emergence. They exhibit thermodynamic disequilibria, nonlinearity. They have multiple equilibria. Uh, remember that, that energy landscape I showed you before with all the different basins on it. They're unpredictable in their behavior. They're sensitive to initial conditions. They exhibit path dependency or in the vernacular history matters. They're highly contingent and they uh, often their behavior exhibits power law frequency distributions. We don't have to go into the details here, but I think what's most interesting is what's happening in the left-hand column. Why are systems complex? What are the underlying characteristics that lead them to be complex? And there's a list of things that we've discerned in our research that we think are fundamental causes of complex systems. I'm not gonna go into them in detail, but I just want everybody to sort of have a first order grasp of this distinction between the underlying causes of complexity and what complexity looks like when you see it. Because what's really important is the underlying causes, high connectivity, high interactivity between causes, both positive and negative feedback loops, and this other, this other set of factors, diversity, decentralization, thermodynamic openness, large energy gradients, competition, competition between uh, agents and evolutionary behavior. In the question period, I can go through some of those things if you want. But what this leads us is to two very short, what I, we would call elevator definitions of complexity. A distinction between two kinds of complexity. Non-adaptive complexity, this would be something like the, the atmospheric system, which is causation with interaction in densely and recursively connected systems. And then adaptive complexity, which involves life. All of the things above that are, that are part of non-adaptive complexity. So you have high interaction between the elements in the system. They're highly connected together. You've got feedback loops, you've got, synergies among causes. You've got all of that, plus you've got agents like bits of life with internal models that might be encoded in their DNA or for human beings uh, represented symbolically in their minds. Internal models of the external environment that govern their, the agent's behavioral responses to their environment and that these internal models co-evolve under selection pressure. And this is what is called complex adaptive systems. And it suggests that the world is really made up of three general categories of complex systems. Complex systems broadly defined, this would be as defined under the first elevator definition there, non-adaptive complexity. And then you have complex adaptive systems. And then within that, you have complex representational adaptive systems. And those are human systems where human beings have symbol rep symbolic representations of their world in representations in their cerebral cortexes. So uh, complex system, the atmosphere, complex adaptive system, uh, living systems such as this rainforest, complex representational adaptive systems, human systems, uh, both technological and social that, uh, that involve meaningful representations of the world in people's heads. So uh, we have 53 minutes. Wrapping up very quickly, uh, in the Cascade Institute, we have tried to make sure that we understand all three elements of uh, these larger complex systems, <clears throat> uh, socio-ecological systems. Uh, and we've been fundamentally influenced by this article that appeared in 2009 at the PNAS, uh, in a research team led by Robert Costanza at the University, at Columbia University. And they distinguish between three categories of things that together structure human societies, worldviews, institutions, and technologies. The worldviews are what's going on in people's heads. The institutions are the sets of rules that we use to organize and regulate our behavior as groups. And then technologies are uh, um, devices that capture physical properties of the natural world to uh, help us solve our problems. And the argument that Costanza et al, Costanza Badeau et al make is that our societies are structured around sets, what they call WIT sets, W-I-T, worldviews, institutions, and technologies that are tightly tied together. And that if you really want to produce change, you have to intervene in all three places simultaneously. So here's an example. Uh, in Western societies, people are deeply committed to personal liberty uh, uh, and freedom. 
uh, that that commitment, cultural and worldview commitment to personal liberty is uh, closely associated with free markets that allow people to express themselves economically, express their liberty economically through free markets. So that's an institutional commitment. And both the commitments to personal liberty and free markets have produced an enormous industry for the production of private cars that allow us to zip all over the place feeling free when we're not stuck in traffic jams caused by everybody else who's trying to be free. So at the Cascade Institute, we have adopted a series of, of approaches to trying to represent, uh, represent this kind of complexity more effectively. I'm not gonna say much about these, I just wanted to flag them for you, but these are our attempts to get beyond the limitations that are apparent within the world three and system dynamics approach, which is still widely used, but uh, misses a lot of things as I was suggesting. Uh, here is an approach that we call Boolean causal loop analysis. It adopts the basic kind of causal loop approach that was used in world three, but also introduces uh, Boolean operators of and and or. So you can talk about clusters of causes that have effects uh, that have effects together. As you can see, you need A and B and C to get D. Uh, D or E uh, has an effect on G, and G then can, can then in turn have an influence on only A within the original set. It turns out that this kind of modeling is extremely powerful, gets us well beyond standard systems uh, causal loop analysis. And then we have a couple of approaches to representing belief systems that are described in Commanding Hope, uh, looking at uh, uh, basically complex systems representations of people's beliefs. This is one I call the state space approach, where we look at people's beliefs. In this case, I'm just using three dimensions, people's beliefs about the differences between groups and their societies, between the amount of agency that people have to determine their fate, and between whether, uh, uh, their, their sense of whether morality is relative or absolute, whether there are absolute rights and wrongs, or whether it's, it tends, uh, right and wrong tends to be contextual. In my state's full state space model, I have 16 dimensions. It provides billions of different possible uh, 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 ideological orientations, a lot of which we probably haven't effectively explored. And that could offer us real opportunities for uh, uh, alternative futures for humanity. And we also have a, another method that we call cognitive, cognitive effective mapping, which allows us to track the emotional commitments that people associate with certain certain uh, things in their environment. Uh, uh, we represent negative emotional responses with red hexagons. You can see that this particular person has a negative emotional response to human-caused climate change. And we represent positive emotional responses with uh, green, green ovals. This, this uh, method of cognitive effective mapping fits quite well with the state space approach so that we can get a much more dynamic and detailed, fine grained understanding of people's beliefs and how they influence people's behavior. And then finally, um, this, uh, uh, this is an approach to systems modeling uh, that I think is a substantial step beyond uh, uh, system dynamics. One of the problems with system dynamics is it requires quite high quality data as input. Uh, this is an approach called uh, uh, cross impact balance assessment, basically produces a matrix of bivariate relationships within the system as understood by experts who are examining the system. They give you an estimate of the causal strength of the relationship between any two variables. And then you build out the system one bivariate relationship at a time. And the really cool thing about this approach is that you can use fuzzy data for those of you who are statisticians, you can use nominal, ordinal, and ordinal data, uh, not just interval and ratio data as your, uh, as your inputs to this modeling approach. And it can help you determine not only uh, equilibrium points, but sensitivity. You can do, do a sensitivity analysis on the system. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, and it, it, so it, it allows us much more effectively to model uh, global systems with the kind of real world data we have uh, where we can't put precise numbers on a lot of things. Okay, so 59 minutes. Uh, so that's, uh, that's where I am, just a little blurb on the Cascade Institute. This is what I'm doing. What I've represented here is 
uh, gives you a sense for our efforts at the Cascade Institute to use complex system science to identify high leverage intervention points to try to push, push help push societies into positive basins of attraction rather than uh, have us go willy nilly into really bad places, which is where we seem to be going right now. Okay, thank you. I think we still have half an hour or so to talk. Thank you, Tad, um, for uh, not only an interesting, but a, uh, a thorough uh, canter over an extraordinary range of ground. Um, our process here, just so everybody knows, given the number of us who are here and the amount of time we have, because Tad will need to get away uh, uh, in about uh, 20 to 30 minutes. So there's no chance that we can deal with every question you've got. Um, but put your questions in the chat. Uh, we will save the chat and um, uh, make sure that Tad has it. And uh, I will not commit him to responding to all the questions, but at least it will give him information uh, that he needs in terms of writing the article he's working on as to the kinds of questions that this group would see. And that too will be a gift to him. So if you would do that, even if your question isn't asked. Um, we'll begin with Dave Doherty and uh, Steve Kurtz, you'll be up next. So uh, Dave, if you would uh, put on your camera, which you have and unmute yourself. Uh, and then after you've asked your question, um, um, remember to mute yourself. Um, and if you would be as brief as possible, uh, many in this group wish to preface their questions with long statements. And just given the time pressures today, I'm asking you to uh, be more disciplined and thanking you for it. Dave. Thank you very much, Tad. On behalf of everybody here, it's a great talk. My question is this, should we consider the deteriorating environment, which you mentioned was uh, produced by the World 3 model, as actually collapsing renewable resources? So it's a great question. You know, what, what metaphor do we use? Uh, I, I, I think more in, in following up with this idea that they're connected together in networks, that it's more the unraveling of renewable resources. It's the simplification, you're taking out links, you're knocking out nodes. And then after a period of time, the thing just falls apart. It actually, there's lots of good research on network theory and complex systems work, where if you, if you depending on the, on the architecture of a network, uh, and I'll say something about that in a second, depending on the particular architecture of a network, if you damage certain parts of it, it can fragment, it can disintegrate. And, uh, and so I think the, the metaphor or the term of unraveling is more effective. And at a certain point, the fa fabric just falls apart. It's, and then you flip to another, another uh, basin of attraction, highly degraded, non less, much less complex basin of attraction. Um, so this raises, raises the question as, as to whether the whole sort of macro metaphor of limits is appropriate. And uh, I have very mixed feelings about the metaphor of limits because it sounds, it, it, it implies to people, and I got a ceiling right here. It implies to people that there's a hard ceiling. And what we're finding is the ceiling, uh, we don't know where the ceiling is and we don't know, and, and, and we may actually push through it for a while and then the system flips. So that's kind of overshoot and collapse. Uh, but limits, the problem with stipulating limits is that people want to know when they're going to hit the limit. And then when it doesn't happen, they say, oh, well, you were wrong. But what's coming out of the research from all those different papers that I was talking about is that we don't know where these thresholds are. And we may not know that we pass one for quite a while. And they may manifest themselves in in complex ways that don't look like limits at all, where everything suddenly stops, right? And so I, I, uh, I think that there are certain, because of the underlying ontology, the underlying causal ontology of the World 3 model, that is almost 
inescapably a part of, the, of system dynamics. It leads you to certain metaphors that in some ways are inappropriate. And that's what I think people like Johan Rockström and some Will Steffen and some of the other folks that, that uh, I cited are exploring. They're trying, to, they're trying to introduce other ways, other metaphors, other diagrams. That's like my that last one. demon on my phone is Hello. Somebody, needs, 60 bucks for the pill. somebody needs to turn off their mic there. I gave her the last payment for the phone. Oh, or be muted. So, so, um, yeah, so they're working, they're trying to, they're trying to elaborate an alternative way of looking at the world rather than humankind being caught in a box and it's running into these limits. Humankind is sliding down a slope and there are these diverging pathways some of which might be reasonably positive and some of which can be terrible for us. It's, it's a very different idea. The other thing I'd say, I'd said that I talk about the nature of network architecture. Complex systems tend to have uh, a, a, a network architecture, um, which is called a scale-free, just in the terminology, a scale-free network architecture, which means they have large and important hubs, nodes that have lots and lots of connections and large numbers of other nodes that don't have a lot of connections. So if you look in ecology, there are some keystone species with lots of connections and a lot of other species that don't have a lot of material and functional connections with other organisms in the system. So they have what's that's called a scale-free architecture. Now, uh, not all complex systems are organized like that, but most are. And uh, it turns out there, and this is important, those scale-free networks are very resilient to the random removal of nodes, which is probably why they've, they've evolved that way. Uh, you, 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 you don't get a complete unraveling of the system, but if you knock out some of those core hubs, those nodes that are highly connected, then you get a system collapse. And, uh, and we're starting to do so much damage to ecosystems that we're starting to knock out hubs. Uh, so again, it's a limit collapse approach, metaphor appropriate here, not entirely convinced. Uh, I think we need new kinds of models yet to be articulated, new kinds of metaphors for popular consumption yet to be articulated. Thank you. Um, Steve Kurtz and then Bill Reese. Steve, you need to turn your mic on. Okay, how's that? Yeah, good, I can hear okay. you. Yes, hi, Ted. Um, this should be a shorter question and answer. Uh, when you mentioned agriculture, the breadbasket, you mentioned some minerals, and then you said that climate change, in your opinion, was the dominant factor that would hit us. And given that the timing of that could be three, four decades, five decades out to, to happen, it may be that energy and fossil fuels in particular become the weaker link that hits first. It could be, of course, one of the other minerals. You mentioned potash. Um, but I, I just think that energy is probably a little easier to quantify um, in, you know, for agriculture rather than what the temperature is going to be in 30 or 40 years. Well, um, yeah. I actually, I, I disagree, Steve, I'm afraid. Um, first of all, uh, petroleum is not a constraint on agriculture around the world right now. Uh, um, but climate is becoming an increasing restraint. restraint. And the, the, by the way, these, these scientists who did that research think these impacts could arrive within a decade. We, we, the, the climate extremes are developing much faster than a lot of climate scientists expected. Um, there's already really good evidence, statistical evidence, that uh, uh, heating has uh, substantially reduced yields in tropical countries already. Um, substantially reduced to the extent that it's actually, uh, you know, having a major economic impact in many of these societies. And that's just the effect of heat shock on crops. You push them above a certain threshold, 35 degrees or so, and you get a dramatic, again, a nonlinear response. Um, uh, it's not even looking potentially at storm effects and things like that. So I can, if you want, I can send you some of this research. I keep a, an eye on it. It's pretty disturbing. 
I think the impacts on global food supply are going to start to become very apparent within the next decade. Um, and, and it's gonna be amplified by the fact that these food systems are very tightly tied together, especially for a certain core set of grains, wheat, uh, soy, corn, and the like rice around the world that provide what? 30% of human protein or something like that. So, uh, so um, the constraint really does appear. And I think, you know, if I'm trying to communicate something to folks here today, the constraints we're running into are constraints in complex systems and predominantly living systems, not in minerals and not in things like oil. And, and, I, I, and that's, I'm saying that despite the fact that in my last book before this one, The Upside of Down, I have a whole chapter on peak oil, which was published right before the fracking boom in the United States. Those of us who are making these kinds of arguments about constraints of constraints of, on growth, which are in a broad sense accurate because climate change is going to wreck a growth around the planet. Those of us who are making these arguments need to reboot in, in, in the face of the evidence that's been coming in over the last 50 years. Thank you. Uh, Bill Reese and then Anitra Thorber. Hi there. Uh, thank you, Ted. I'm still trying to catch my breath after that. Um, I'm wondering about your distinction between complex and simple resources. So, for example, climate change is really a pollution problem. The carbon dioxide is the largest waste product by weight of industrial economies, and yet it results from the use of a simple resource, and you're framing a, a non-renewable resource, and yet its use has all the horrific consequences on the complex systems yes. that you're describing. So yes. is the distinction between the two really all that simple when you consider the massive systemic interactions between these two kinds of resources? And simply, since climate change is a pollution problem, doesn't that conform with the limits to growth? The projection of pollution would become a problem by the early to mid part of this century. Well, I suppose in some very general sense it does, but, but it remember, was a general model, right? I mean, yeah, it was yeah, but remember that what they were pointing to is the impacts of scarcity. It's not scarcity of oil that's affecting us. It's scarcity of absorption capacity of the climate for the carbon dioxide that's produced from burning that oil, right? So, so uh, at the core, at the core of the limits to growth approach, and boy, am I ever receptive to this, is, a, is essentially a Neil Malthusian perspective about scarcities and population growth, reducing scarcities as population growth and consumption growth run into ceilings of, of resource availability. Um, what it turns, it, what, what I, the argument I'm making is it turns out that the scarcities we have to worry about are these scarcities of renewable systems because they have this capacity to fragment and to flip from one state to another, and they exhibit hysteresis. It's not scarcity of petroleum. Now, you're absolutely right. The combustion of that petroleum is, is damaging the renewable resources, right? It's actually increasing the scarcity of those, not just because it's absorbing the space in the atmosphere for, it's, it's absorbing some of the carbon dioxide sink that's available in the atmosphere, which is true, but also because as that climate change happens, it's actually degrading the ability of the biosphere to absorb more carbon dioxide because it's causing uh, permafrost to thaw and huge emissions of carbon dioxide. It's, it's uh, causing wildfires that are emitting huge amounts of carbon dioxide and you're losing that absorption capacity in the forests. It seems like, it seem, uh, it seems like it's reducing the sink capacity of oceans as they warm. So you're getting these, you're actually getting a shrinking of the absorptive capacity of the climate in part because of its interconnected complex nature, right? And because you're damaging a lot of the life forms that sustain, sustain it. I mean, in Ludlockian terms, you're killing Gaia, right? Okay. But doesn't that imply limits in a, in a soft sense? We, we've exceeded some limit of the capacity of the system with the similar yes. carbon dioxide. Yeah, so yeah. It's not a hard ceiling, but it's not. A, it, it, but it's a it's a very different kind of ceiling. And if if I I'm, I'm sure we can continue to use limits mm -hmm. language, and I will. Okay, but but we if we fight our battles on minerals and petroleum, we're going to lose because the data are against us. If we fight our battles 
on renewables and complex systems and how they're being degraded, and by the way, how fundamentally important they are for human well-being, like pollinators and that absorptive capacity in the atmosphere. If we fight our battles there, the evidence shows that we're right, right? So that's all I'm ultimately I'm arguing. And, and yes, those are limits. Those are limits. I, 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 I have some intuitive feeling that every time we talk about limits, because it implies hard ceilings, we get ourselves in trouble. It's a much more dynamic environment we're operating in. And what we've learned is that human beings have this incredible capacity to innovate in the face of even renewable resource scarcities for a while through things like fish farming and stuff. It, you, you know all about this. I mean, you're the expert on this. So, you know, we push back those boundaries for a while and then pow, it all starts to fall apart. And it's starting to fall apart mostly Again, a complex systems response is starting to fall apart mostly in those parts of the world that have less capital and energy to throw at their problems. You know, just as you've been saying for, for many years. And, and then, then you get into my bailiwick, which is the social disintegration that results, which is creeping from the periphery towards the core of the international system. Uh, and that's, you know, encouraging things like authoritarian populism and stuff. So, so yeah, I, we can call it limits. Um, but the real, the real thing I want to get across to folks here who have grown up within this paradigm of, of, of mineral scarcity is that we actually put our money on the wrong thing when we were talking about peak oil. And I, you know, I admit that myself. Fair enough. Bottom line, there's no we're way in trouble. <laughs> That's right. There's no way out of this. From we're in real trouble. And, yeah. And, and, and the other thing is, so I, I think, you know, it was, it was, I think Fred Hoyle who made this point and Ronald Wright picked it up at one point with this remarkable metaphor. And I think you've used it, Bill, about we were kicking the rungs out the ladder underneath us. So, so we are able to sustain, humankind is able to sustain the systems for uh, aggregating these increasingly low entropy mineral resources and concentrating them into high entropy forms, excuse me, aggregating these increasingly high entropy mineral resources because they're degraded and less quality and concentrating them into low entropy or ordered forms that we can use to sustain our system. But that requires a huge technological apparatus. As that starts to break down, we will not be able to, there, there's going to be no high quality of petroleum left that's easily available. The fisheries are going to be gone. All, the, all of those low entropy systems that have allowed us to build, planet, build a planetary civilization of enormous wealth are are going to be gone and we are going to be able to rebuild our economic system from the bottom up. And you and I are on the same page there. This idea is, oh, well, you know, so this civilization wipes itself out another 100,000 years, another will arise. Sorry, this is it on this planet. Sure. Tad, let me just check with you about time. Yeah, uh, I can go another 15 minutes or so. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I'll keep that in mind. Uh, Anitra, you're up. And John Meyer, you're next. All right, Ted, I agree with you that one of the big factors that was wrong was the concept of uh, renewables, but what was completely left out and which I don't think they comprehended was the regeneration techniques of the key. And I say key because I don't mean every single one, ecosystems in the world, in the Arctic, the tropical, the terrestrial, the, uh, the oceanic. And of course, if this were done wisely, by that I mean picking the ones that are gonna give you most bang for your buck in terms of temperature lowering first and then going to some of the others, this would do a great deal of, um, a great deal of good to give us some time to think about all the other systems. Now, this is not going to solve the hysteresis problem and the nonlinearity problem of going over the brink to a different level. Uh, and some of the, certainly none of the social problems, although it would create a whole lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering how you would, how you would factor massive large-scale regeneration of ecosystems into yeah. your thesis? Well, one of the projects we have at the Cascade Institute is to look 
at, at permafrost carbon feedback because it looks like the permafrost is now emitting somewhere around half a billion tons of carbon a year. So it's one of the first really big positive feedbacks to kick in as it's thawing. And how we can not only slow that process, but perhaps reverse it by increasing uh, biological regenerative capacity and carbon fixation in areas that have been damaged by permafrost thaw. Um, you know, the, the, the thing that people will point to immediately is reforestation. Uh, but, you know, most of these trees we're planting are going to die because the, the, the climate bands within which, which they survive are, are moving so fast northwards. And, we're, and uh, the, the change is happening too quickly. Now, there may be some bioengineering approaches we can use, but I think actually what we're gonna to default to as things get really bad is um, solar radiation management. I think it's horrible to contemplate, but we're going to start trying to increase the reflectivity of Earth's atmosphere. And that will probably be triggered by uh, evidence that there's going to be a rapid increase in sea levels around the world. And the, you've probably been following some of the stuff that's coming out of the Antarctic. I mean, that people, some, a lot of these glaciologists and ice, sea ice specialists are really, really concerned about what's happening in Greenland and Antarctic. Antarctic. So, so I, I, I would certainly keep what you're suggesting on the table, 100%. But um, the, the kinds of systems and things we can do at scale fast are very, very much along the lines of kind of reforestation, conventional reforestation. And uh, uh, I don't think, I think first of all, as my neighbor here on Vancouver Island, one of the world's leading specialists in carbon forest carbon cycles, Werner Kurtz has said, you know, you plant these little trees and it's two decades before they start absorbing any substantial amount of carbon dioxide. And by that time, the climate's going to be changed so much that the, the, the trees, which are still vulnerable because they're young, will die or they'll burn, right? So, so, um, so here's just one point I wanted to make that I think I neglected in my presentation. We've been misled by, one reason I want to get away from the terminology of renewables and non-renewables is that the, the, the adjective renewable has always implied for people that if you kind of manage things right, they're infinitely available. It actually turns out they're because they have these complex systems characteristics, they're actually in many respects more vulnerable than non-renewable resources. And, uh, and so the renewable term terminology is actually, um, in some sense, done the conversation a lot of damage. Uh, we, I would always look for ways of working with these renewable resource systems in the Amazon and in permafrost areas and things to see what we can do to increase that regenerative capacity. And that's what we're trying to do in our permafrost project. But uh, I'm not holding out game-changing hope there, I'm afraid. Well, you take the Arctic, and of course, that's the slowest possible growth. If you go into the tropics with the mangroves, yes. the seagrass, and the coral reefs, yep. that would be the first priority because these yep. things will fill up massive spaces in a year yes. or two year and, yes. and the, five to 10 times more yes. uh, scrubbing of carbon out of the air. So, yep, yep. you know, I mean, and that's why I said very wisely scaled. Uh, it's part of the solution, I think. You also need, unfortunately, you need civil order and good uh, governmental capacity and state capacity in those regions to implement. Yes, of course, of course. That's a whole other thing. Yes. Yeah. But, <laughs> but sure, let's keep it on the table. Absolutely. We need every arrow in our quiver at this point. Thank you. John Meyer. Um, and... <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thanks, Ted. Uh, tremendous. I, I, I don't want to throw out the uh, the cost of uh, commodities quite yet, uh, partly because it's uh, conventionally measured in dollars, and I, I think uh, uh, monetary uh, metrics uh, hide a huge amount. Yes, I agree. My, my, my question is. The apparent stable costs of commodities may hide a very different biophysical reality, uh, especially with declining ROIs of energy. If a commodity production is based on depleting resource bases require higher per unit energy inputs, the system is less stable. And perhaps more importantly, uh, when we finally, when humanity uh, finally uh, comes up uh, with their uh, climate Pearl Harbor day and says, yes, 
we have a problem. Let's change instantly. Uh, uh, we're going to be converting from a fossil fuel society economy to an electrical renewable energy society economy. The characteristics of those uh, 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 energy sources and uses are rad and uh, regional distribution are radically different. And I think that uh, then uh, the, uh, uh, th that presents all kinds of cascading supply problems, which are hinted at biophysical analysis rather than uh, uh, smoothed over by uh, the, uh, uh, the, the dollar metrics, which don't display any kind of structure. Right. Okay. So I agree with all of that. Um, it, 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 but un unfortunately, the dollar figures are th the measure of scarcity that drives the market. Right. And, uh, and so we don't have economic, as defined within these markets, economic scarcity of oil in the world, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, what was, and frankly, that was not expected uh, by all the uh, by all the peak oil advocates and and aficionados of whom I was one, right? Mm -hmm. um, because we underestimated, as I think people like Julian Simon have rightfully pointed out, the capacity when it comes to these mineral resources for markets to throw enormous capital at key scarcity problems and develop technologies to push through them. Now. To be fair, and you sort of alluded to the energy return on investment concept, which I think is actually core. And that's, that's the one that goes all the way through my book, The Upside of Down. Mm -hmm. uh, the fracking revolution was enabled by incredibly cheap money. Very, virtually none of those companies operating in Texas and the Dakotas actually, has ever actually made money. Right. Um, they've been, they, it's been a shell game. They borrowed huge amounts of money and, uh, and, and, uh, and it's been, it's that the investors have been looking for high returns in an extremely low interest rate environment. Uh, and so I think that that, that fracking, fracking boom wouldn't have occurred to anywhere near the scale it did no. if interest rates had been a lot higher. If you look at the energy return on investment figures for fracking, they're not great. They're actually a, a lot worse than a lot of conventional oil. And oh, by the way, conventional oil has actually peaked in its production around the world. Yeah. So. So uh, remember in what I was saying, I was saying as long as we have sufficient energy, we can dig up the planet. And as long as we're prepared to trash as much as the planet is, as we need to, we can dig up sufficient earth to concentrate the minerals that we need uh, to keep our industrial civilization running. But that's underlined by as long as we have sufficient energy. Um, but of course, one of those minerals is petroleum itself. If we're prepared to drive past five or 600 parts per million in the atmosphere, we can continue using fossil fuels to concentrate, to concentrate the minerals to drive our industrial civilization, which is kind of what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for making all my points for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we agree. Thank you. And, and Gordon, yours will be the last question um, uh, other than mine. So if you're ready. Yeah, I'm ready. Um, my question is referring based upon the ideas of two men, one called Ernest Becker, who wrote a book about the denial of death. Oh, yes. Well, I have a whole chapter on him in Commanding Hope. Yeah, and it, the whole idea that I see, and also based upon Jared Diamond's idea that every society is simply a social experiment, um, and they always run their course, and eventually they, their time is up. And I, I think we just need more. Why can't we just face the fact that the way our society functions is, you know, the data is clear that we're done and let's work. You, you know, you referred to it earlier. The, the fact is that we have to redo our entire society. Our society itself is stuck. I can't see it being unstuck. Now, you said earlier that you don't see a hope for anything else after the, our industrial society collapses. No, I, I no, I, I just very quickly want to intervene. That's not what I said, or not what I intended to say. Um, uh, if if we lose the technological complexity that we have in our societies right now, we're in real trouble. Okay, we need to yep. make a transition transition while sustaining a high level of technological complexity. 
Well, I would say that based upon the data and my experience in politics, the, the, the nasty stuff out there, is that's not going to happen. I think that is not being hopeful. I think that's being in denial, as in, in Ernest Becker's way of thinking about denial. And we have the, the courageous, hopeful thing to do is to say, you know what? What we're doing, we're on the Titanic. There's the hope of us changing it. There's no evidence to show that there's been any change of course at all in any fundamental way. There's no evidence. There's tinkering. There's good people doing good things. I agree with that but no fundamental change. And societies don't make big changes historically until they get a kick in the teeth. No society, they all think every society has manifest destiny. We're special. The rules of history don't apply to us. And we're suffering from the same hubris. And so I think hope, or hope the way you're preventing hope is not helpful, basically. Well, okay, hope so needs to be bigger than that. Gordon, you need to read my book because everything, much of what you've said is in my book. I, I, look, I would say that the chances of us pulling out of this death spiral are probably around 2%, 2 to 5%. Yep. If I'm yep. talking to young people, I might say 20, okay? Yep. But not higher, okay? And, and so the chances are very low, but Ruben, I was gonna put this, uh, I was gonna put my 3D landscape with the two basins of attraction, the Mad Max and the <laughs> Renew the Future landscape on the screen, but I, there wasn't enough time. But really, Gordon, uh, you're, you're, and it's partly because I wasn't talking about hope today, okay? This was not my agenda. Um, but you are actually mis misinterpreting what I'm saying or that it's not a fair representation of my, my approach. I actually think we are in, we are seriously foobard, okay? Seriously foobard. And I think, I think there's a very high probability my children will not live out their full lifespans, okay? And I, I am a specialist and I wanna make this clear. I am a specialist in violent conflict. The reason I am studying these issues and I got involved in them originally is because all of this points towards massive, massive violence around the planet. And, and we're not talking about, well, okay, it's gonna collapse and we can move on to something else. We're talking about billions of people dying. So that's where I think the likelihood lies. Yeah, that's what so I think in that too. respect, we're, but I'm not prepared with, with, with a child of 16, another one of 13, I'm not prepared to leave it at that. And that may be where we part company. In part because when, when, when you understand complex systems, you understand that in the adjacent possible, in the world that we can't effectively see, there are often all kinds of possibilities, even positive ones that aren't recognized because we just can't see them yet. And I use the story, and we could have a long conversation and kind of out of time, but I use the story in the book about South Africa. So in, uh, in 1983, uh, I hitchhiked with a friend all over South Africa. Uh, and we spent time with every racial group in the country. Whites, blacks, Indians, coloreds, the whole group, all of them. And we talked at length with people. And what we heard from everybody, well, almost without exception, is that apartheid is coming to an end, but it's going to be a bloodbath as a result. If, if my friend and I had said, well, you know, Mandela's going to be released and is going to negotiate with de Klerk, the president of uh, South Africa, to chart a pathway for a peaceful transition of the society to a democracy. We, people would have said that's ridiculous. It's a fantasy. Now, South Africa is a deeply troubled society by any reasonable interpretation. But that dystopic outcome, that highly, highly traumatic, negative, pessimistic outcome didn't actually come to pass. It wasn't seen the positive possibility wasn't seen as a possibility. The thing about complex systems is there are things that reside just beyond the boundary of the adjacent possible that we can't see. So one more example. Can I just say something there? No, let, let me finish, let me finish. Right, sure. Okay. Um, if on August the 18th, 2018, I had said to this group, especially to this group, but practically to anybody, a girl of 15 is going to sit on the steps of the Swedish parliament with this little sign saying school strike for climate is going to mobilize hundreds of millions of people around the world on the climate issue and is going to appreciably affect normative conditions for talking about the climate issue around the planet. One person, we'd have said that's impossible. That's not going to happen. And yet it happened. One person, Greta Thunberg, right? Now, it's not enough. It doesn't get us close to where we need to go but it was something that wasn't seen or expected at the time. 
the Cascade Institute is about finding those possibilities before it's too late. Okay, and if by starting from the premise that they don't exist, we are going to produce the future we least want. I agree with you there, but in your South African example, which was excellent, they all admitted that apartheid is over. We're not admitting that modern exponential growth neoliberalism is over. And until we, I'm saying, until we admit that, just like we admit that apartheid is over, we can't come to the rapprochement as in South Africa. That's what I'm saying. We have to yes, admit to I, that. I, I, so I like your South African example. I think it's yeah, great. I, I, I think that's right. Although I think that the idea uh, of moving beyond conventional notions of economic growth, if you look at the polling data, it's much more broadly held, especially the young, by young cohorts than now. One of the things that's going on with Trumpist mobilization of, of nativist populism in the United States, it's the section of the society that's not willing to acknowledge this and is going to suffer most from the transition from a conventional economic growth to some model to something new has decided to simply say, no, we are not going to let that happen. We're go we don't want to change. And, and that's so what we're seeing with the radicalization of the right in, in the United States is a significant consequence of lower growth rates. But that's yep. a separate conversation. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very okay. much. And I will uh, not ask my question in light of the hour uh, and uh, turn this over to Jean, uh, who will thank you. But let me add my voice to hers. Uh, I am tickled pink. Uh, Tad, that you accepted the invitation to come and speak to us, and uh, as host, want to thank you. Uh, thank Jean, you. It's, I really, really appreciate the opportunity, and uh, this is a very important group in Canada, by the way. You need to get some uh, some people with a little less gray hair, <laughs> <laughs> and I include myself in that. Anyway, um, Tad, on behalf of KCOR, it. It's, I'm delighted to be able to say thank you so much for an absolutely fabulous presentation. Incredibly complicated, but you were able to give examples and, and um, ex explanations that helped clarify what you were actually talking about. This has just been fabulous. And um, I would also like to say that this anniversary year for the limits of growth coming up, having this explanation um, updating, analysis, and expansion of all of this has just been absolutely fantastic. And I really hope that we will be able to use this as an, uh, an opportunity to get people to, to move ahead on what needs to be done if we are able to survive as a species. As a paleontologist, studying mass extinctions was something I was going on. And what blew through my mind was the fact that these nodes that you're talking about might be the way in which you can talk about some of these mass extinctions. Yeah. Interesting idea. Have to think about that one. Anyway, for again, thank you so much. It's been an absolutely fantastic presentation. Um, for those of you who are here still on the, on the thing, I invite you to be able to look at this presentation again. It will be put onto our KCOR website, CanadianCore.com, within the next uh, 24, 48 hours, along with the uh, question and answer periods. Tad, you'll be able to look at some of the questions that were not asked during this presentation. So that would be good. So we also would like to say to everybody, please go onto our website, click on the stay informed stuff. You'll be able to get all the invitations to future meetings, future discussions and things that are going on. In addition to that, if you wish to join the Canadian Association for the Club of Rome, you can also, for a nominal fee, be able to join the association and get all of the benefits of membership, including uh, being part of the discussions that are going on outside of, of um, our visible areas. So with that, I would like to say thank you very, very much. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again, I hope. and. Uh, Really, really wonderful presentation. Thank you. Thank you all very much. All and the best. You're free to leave. Uh, many of us will hang around. Okay, I'm off. Carry on. So you all need the best. off with your life. Yep. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.